All right, well, this is lesson number two of how to play the Musket and Pike series games by GMT. And uh, in, in the first lesson, we basically looked at the pieces, the, the numbers on them, what do they mean. We talked about the leaders. They're called commanders in the game. You have wing commanders, and then you have an army commander. Uh, we looked at the uh, how orders are really the heart of the game and how f the role that formations uh, play with the given units. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at the action phase in a little bit more detail. The sequence of play is pretty straightforward. You have an initiative phase where you determine which side goes first. And uh, that's determined by whichever uh, of the two armies has the most formations under charge orders. If uh, both uh, sides have the same number of formations under charge orders, uh, the tiebreaker is then the uh, wing commander with the best uh, leadership rating. If they're still tied, then you dice for it. So in our battle right here in Edge Hill, the Royalist Army under King Charles, all three of his formations are under charge orders, and all of the parliamentary uh, formations are under received charge orders, and so uh, the charge orders will, will get the, uh, the precedence here. So uh, Royalists are going to go first. If none of the ar formations of either side were under charge orders, then you look at the, the most that are under um, uh, prepare. What is it? Uh, my mind just went blank. I forgot the name of the order. Uh, make ready. <laughs> uh, you look at the number of, of guys that are under make ready formation, and uh, you follow the same mechanics uh, as with charge. Whoever has the most formations under make ready goes first, and, and it goes back and forth like that. Uh, if, if nobody is under make ready, then the most under uh, receive charge. And if, if, an if everybody's formations are under uh, rally orders, then they are required to withdraw from the field and the game would end at that point. Well, right here, um, the Royalists are going to be able to go first, so that's what happens in the initiative phase. And uh, then we get to the activation phase, and that's where the heart of the game takes place. And we're going to look at that in some more detail. Uh, after the act activation phase is done, you have a route movement phase and then a marker removal phase. So we'll go ahead and start here with the uh, uh, with the sequence of the action phase. The first thing that happens in an action phase is the 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 player who does not have an active who, who's not the active player, uh, the inactive player gets the opportunity to make a single preemption attempt. That is, it's his opportunity to steal the activation and be able to preemptively activate one of his own formations. For example, uh, before the, uh, the Parliament Act gets a chance to uh, take their, uh, one of their wings and, and begin to operate with it, say, I, I go ahead and take Prince Rupert here and activate the right-hand uh, uh, cavalry for the, for the Royalists. What, uh, what can happen over on the Parliament side is perhaps uh, Ramsey, who controls the left-wing uh, cavalry for the Parliament, uh, could attempt to make an, a, a preemption die roll. Now, there's some drawbacks to failure. We talked about this a little bit last week, but let me reiterate this. There's a continuation and preemption table that you will find on the mm -hmm. charts. It's on the very first page of the foldout, right beneath the orders restrictions chart. You, what you do with this is you look at the current order of the formation that wants to either uh, to make a continuation or a preemption attempt, and then you'll uh, apply certain modifiers to that. Uh, right now, uh, Ramsey is under uh, received charge orders, and so if he wants to preempt, he needs to roll a 0 through 2. So he's got a 30% chance of success. Uh, the only modifiers that would apply here would be a minus 1 because it's a cavalry wing. So he's actually got a 40% chance of, of making a preemption. And uh, so that opportunity is, is available to him here. If he fails the preemption attempt, the drawback is that he loses any chance of continuation later on in the turn. If he's already marked with a marker indicating that status, uh, then he would be marked as finished and would lose all opportunity to activate during his turn. So use your preemptions with care. Uh, only when absolutely necessary. In this case, we're going to go ahead and forego the opportunity for uh, the Royalists to preempt. The next thing that happens is we have orders change opportunity. If you want to change your orders, you could do that here. Um, one of the things that might be of advantage to do here to give Prince Rupert maybe a little bit more control in his uh, attack 
is to try to get into make ready orders. In other words, get out of charge. So we're gonna go ahead and make that attempt here. To do this, we look at the uh, orders change table, which is on the first page of your foldout. And you look at the current order and you cross index that with the desired order that you wanna change into. So from charge orders to make ready, you need to roll a zero through three. There'll be a minus two modifier, which is the wing commander's leadership rating. The Army Commander King Charles doesn't have a rating, so even if he was in or adjacent to Prince Rupert, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, it is a cavalry ring, but the cavalry ring does not want to uh, change into charge orders. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's about it. There's, there's no modifiers besides the Wing Commander's leadership that's going to apply here. So we roll a single D10. It's a 2, so it is successful. Now, if it fails, the only uh, the only penalty is that you simply lost. You know, you simply failed. There's no um, other detriment to the uh, the formation by failing an orders change. There are certain conditions that will force you to change orders, so don't forget that. If all of the guys in a formation are formation broken or morale shaken or worse, uh, then you will be compelled to automatically change into rally orders. All right, so we changed the order for Prince Rupert. That's what happens next. Now we do the perform actions. One by one, every single unit and the, the wing commander included in the, uh, this formation will be given the opportunity to perform a single action. Uh, when this is done, there'll be opportunity for close combat to take place. Now, remember with make ready orders, you cannot uh, move adjacent to an enemy unit. However, if he moves close enough to cavalry, uh, enemy cavalry could conceivably intercept and still provoke a uh, close combat opportunity. It's also possible to be under make ready orders, uh, but due to uh, other circumstances in the turn, uh, to have a unit that's adjacent to an enemy unit, uh, you would still be able to engage in close combat. So the orders don't prevent you from engaging in close combat. They, it's mostly a restriction of moving uh, in proximity to the enemy. Once all the close combat opportunities are done, uh, there will be a continuation attempt. So the leader will be given the opportunity to uh, uh, activate his formation a second time. Move again after after two successful continuations. In other words, after three activations of an entire wing, uh, the leader will be marked as finished. You can't go more than uh, three activations with a given formation. All right, so Prince Rupert's formation has been activated. The big question is, okay, well now what can I do with my units when they're act activated? Here's here's the long and the short of it. There's there's a number of things you can do here. Uh, I want to say there's seven things that you can do. Uh, with a unit during an activation phase. First is you can move with those units. If you have a cavalry unit, cavalry unit have the ability to move and uh, engage in pistol fire, or they can just move, or they can uh, just engage in pistol fire without movement. The range for pistol fire is adjacent, just so you know. And I don't believe I mentioned this last week, but I should also point this out, that unlike uh, some game systems like uh, Great Battles of History, uh, there, is, there really is no uh, zones of control in the game. So you can move adjacent to, uh, to enemy units and not get uh, stuck into an, you know, a uh, zone of control like in some other game systems. So just, just be aware of that. Uh, so you can move, you can do uh, pistol fire with, uh, with cavalry, you can do actually both. You can ride up to uh, adjacent to an enemy unit, uh, engage in pistol fire. Third thing you could do is with, uh, uh, with infantry, they can engage in uh, uh, infantry fire. Now th remember the infantry can't move and engage in infantry fire. But within that confine there is a form of infantry fire that does allow the counter to move a single hex. And we'll talk about that when we get to the uh, the fire combat. It's technically not movement, it's, it's actually a fire. So with infantry, you either fire or you move. You can't do both like you can with cavalry. Uh, in, artillery can, in, can engage in fire combat, artillery fire, uh, but they can only do this once per turn, not per activation per mm. turn. So once artillery is fired, the counter will be marked over to its fired side. Uh, you can also engage in a rally opportunity if your uh, morale is not normal, if you're in a morale shaken or a morale broken state, uh, you can try to improve the morale of the unit 
by uh, doing a rally action so long as your orders allow for that. Uh, the only two orders that allow for rally opportunities though are the, uh, the rally orders and the receive charge orders. Alright, so you can move, you can move and fire with cavalry, infantry can just fire. Um, there is another form of fire that infantry can do. There's normal infantry fire and then there's something known as salvo fire. Now if you bought the most recent co uh, game from GMT, the uh, Saints in Armor, uh, remember that salvo fire is not available in any of those battles. Uh, but it is available in the, uh, I think pretty much every other game in the, in the system. Last thing you could do uh, with the unit is you could do a reform. Now remember, you can only do one of these things. So if you, uh, if your your unit's in a morale or excuse me, a formation shaken or a formation broken condition, and you want to uh, improve its formation so it can be more mobile, uh, you know you can uh, do a reform action. But if you do reform, you can't move. So you can, each unit is going to be able to do one of these things. Now, with charge orders, we are compelled to move towards uh, an enemy unit that doesn't already have one of our guys uh, adjacent to them already. So, we're going to go ahead and start. You, there's no requirement that you have to start with a certain unit. Uh, so, you can just pick a, a unit that hasn't taken its action within the uh, activated formation and do its single action. And you do these all one at a time. We'll start with the Musketeer here on the far right. Uh, you'll probably remember from last week we talked about the numbers on the counters. There is no movement ratings put on the counters. It's standard across the series that light infantry like musketeers and dragoons are given a six movement point rating. Cavalry have an eight movement point rating. Heavy infantry can move uh, four, they have four movement points. Uh, artillery are immobile in this game. Uh, this accursed civil war, as well as in Saints in Armor. So we don't even have to worry about artillery. They, they can't move. They're stuck. So we're going to go ahead and start here with the Musketeer. And he's, gonna, he's got six movement points, and he's going to have to move towards an enemy unit. But he, there's an anti-suicide clause in the, in the rules. You're not compelled to take light infantry and move them adjacent to heavy infantry. So we're going to go ahead and take the Musketeer, and we're going to move up along these hedges here to skirmish with the enemy uh, musketeer line. Now as you move a unit, you're going to encounter all kinds of different terrain and these are all explained in the, the TEC, the terrain effects chart, on the inside fold of the series charts. If you open up the fold and look on the left, you'll see extensive the terrain information. That encompasses pretty much all the games. There is some special terrain you'll encounter in some games and so you'll find a modified line on the, uh, the back of the rule books. For, for some of the other games. Here we're going to encounter some uh, some hedges. So it's hexside terrain and I'm trying to see what the uh, modifiers going to be. Okay, there's three different kinds of modifiers uh, that you're going to find with uh, with uh, the terrain. You're going to find that there's a movement point cost to enter. There's a uh, line of sight information, whether it blocks line of sight, and then there will be combat effects uh, for each piece of terrain. Hedges are going to give a plus one uh, movement cost above the ordinary hex cost uh, to enter terrain in a, in a given situation for heavy infantry. So if you got heavy infantry moving forward uh, across the hedge, it's going to cost an extra movement point. Same thing for cavalry and same thing for light infantry. If you look at the chart, if you have your chart open and are able to look at it, uh, you'll see that with with uh, hedge hex side, there's an asterisk next to the plus one on the heavy infantry and cavalry columns. What that signifies is that by crossing that terrain, you not only pay the terrain cost, but you encounter a uh, you, you're subject to a formation hit, which degrades the formation uh, one level. So from formation normal to formation shaken. Now at the start of the game, there's a number of things that you can you can do to try to mitigate some against some of this. For example, the King's uh, uh, Lifeguards, the, the Prince of Wales Cavalry, uh, the Second uh, Brigade of Morris on the uh, the Royalist side. These these guys are all behind these hedges, and so they're going to have to move across these things, and they're going to end up uh, formation shaken. Uh, what you could do to to mitigate against this is start the game uh, by putting putting them into uh, open order rather than in uh, the normal formation. I've chosen not to do that in this in this case. 
So we're going to take the musketeer and move him, but you'll, you'll notice that the musketeers uh, are light infantry, and on the light infantry column there's no asterisks. That's because uh, they're never subject to formation hits. So we can go ahead and move him one, two, uh, let's see, three, four, how about this, five, six, like so. And you'll see that by move, in, in moving them this way, I have actually, and that's probably not the most efficient way to move him, I could have actually gone like this. I could have gone one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll get a hex further by doing it that way. Um, you'll notice that uh, when, I'm, when I'm moving this guy, uh, I'm moving him into one of the two forward hexes. Facing is important in the game. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to use a couple markers here. We'll use an, one of these open order markers. Where I'm placing the two open order markers, these are the frontal hexes of a one hex unit. If I move them to the sides here, these are the flank hexes, and these two are the rear hexes. Units must always move into the, one of the two forward hexes. Uh, if you want to change the movement, you actually have to rotate the counter. And I'm trying to find the controls for this, okay. And to rotate the counter, uh, cost one movement point uh, per hex side that you that you turn them. So, in this case, we just went ahead and marched him forward. With a uh, double-sided uh, unit like uh, these guys over here, there's going to be obviously two flank hexes, but you're going to have three hexes that are rear and three hexes that are frontal. So, just be aware of, of those particular rules. All right, Dragoons are Light Infantry too. I'm going to move them forward. One, two, three, four, five, and six, like so. You'll also notice that I moved them out of command. Uh, when these guys ended their move, they're actually out of command. That's perfectly acceptable to do. Uh, it's, you only trace command when a unit is first activated. So as I activate these guys, before I do anything with them, I have to determine whether they're in command or not. If they're out of command, they must try to move so as to place themselves back in command unless they're already adjacent to an enemy unit. All right, King's lifeguards are actually on a hedge-lined road, which is actually hex terrain, not hex side terrain. Um, we're going to go ahead and move him out of that, though. Move him one, two. Now as we do that, he takes a formation hit. So we've got to flip him over. I'm trying to find the uh, right click function. There we are. All right, so now he's formation shaken. Now, here's what happened. When you go formation shaken, you only have half the amount of movement points that you already have. Uh, however, when you begin moving a unit, when a unit's activated, its, its movement points are locked in. So even though he's morale shake, uh, he's formation shaken, he still has uh, his full movement points left. So he's only used two of the eight. Uh, so he's still got six movement points left. But if he takes a second uh, formation hit and becomes formation broken, he must immediately stop. So remember that detail. So um, with six movement points left, I could move him. Let's see, Hedgeline Road cost three movement points for cavalry and a formation hit. So if I move him back into a hedge line road, he's going to be stuck. But what I'm going to do with him is I'm going to move him one, two, three, four, five. And I've got one more point left. I'm just going to go ahead and stop him there. Uh, next up, we'll go ahead and take this guy two, three, four, five, six, seven. And he's becomes formation uh, shaken by crossing that hedge. Morris will move two, four, six, eight, and he becomes formation shaken. Now at this point I have not activated the wing commander yet. Uh, wing commanders, when they are activated, they can do one of two things. They can either move eight movement po up to eight movement points, or, and they move as cavalry would move, uh, unless the, the terrain is prohibited to cavalry, in which case they would move as heavy infantry. Um, so he can move eight movement points, or he can influence a rally or reform action should his orders allow that. So if you choose to move him, you can't do any reforms or any, any of those other things. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and activate him, but I'm just going to I'm going to move him and I'm going to stack him with Morris. And then we'll go ahead and take Rupert. Let's see, two, four, six, and stop him there. And the other Morris, we'll go back one, two, three, four, five. We'll put him there. Byron, two, four, five, six, seven. All right, they're all kind of bunched up, and that's not always the good uh, a good idea. But we went ahead and did it anyways here to show something. Uh, everybody in the formation has now uh, taken its action. So the next thing we do in the activation cycle is we look at. Um, uh, uh, any close combat opportunities. If, if we're adjacent to any units, we pre-designate it which, which of our guys are going to attack enemy guys. And then if any of the enemy uh, units are, are adjacent to our guys, but we haven't designated them as a target for close combat, then that, uh, that enemy unit gets an opportunity to attack one of our guys. So in this case, we don't have that situation. So we're going to go ahead and skip close combat. We'll be given a uh, continuation attempt. So using Pr Prince Rupert, we can uh, try to continue. And according to the continuation and preemptions table, if we are in make ready orders, we need to roll a zero through two. And Rupert's uh, modifier of minus two plus minus one because he commands a cavalry wing uh, will give us a, a net minus three modifier. So we rolled a 7, minus 3 is a 4, it's just a, a, a tad too much. So he's going to be finished for the turn. But what I'm going to do here is let's, let's just pretend for a moment that he had succeeded. Let's, let's uh, roll it again. Okay, we roll a 2 and say he succeeds. What happens then is the activation cycle uh, flips right back around, and so the enemy is given another opportunity for a preemption. This might be worthwhile doing here, and so Ramsey... And the reason why you might want to do this is you don't want an enemy formation just maneuvering unanswered uh, around you. So I think it would be advisable for Ramsey to go ahead and try to uh, uh, unhinge that by uh, preempting. So why Ramsey? Well, because he's, he's someone I, I, want to, I want to preserve the infantry and just kind of see what uh, the, the Royalist infantry does before I, I try that, because I, I do have a good leader back there. The uh, uh, Balfour commands the, uh, the center of the parliamentary line, but the problem is I don't want to activate that formation yet, so I don't want to preempt with that formation. So we'll go ahead and try with Ramsey, and he'll just have a minus one modifier because he's a cavalry formation. He rolls a three, which is modified to a two, and under receive charge orders, that is just enough for preemption. Because the preemption is successful and Prince Rupert was in the midst of a continuation, he is marked as finished rather than bypassed. If Prince Rupert was initially starting his very first activation of the turn and he was, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, enemy was able to preempt, he would be marked with a bypassed marker and uh, so he would be given an opportunity to uh, activate later in the sequence. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so uh, next thing up is Ramsey. He's activated everybody, but because he's under received charge orders, uh, that means that he's, uh, his units can only move one hex. We'll go ahead and start with the Musketeers, and this Musketeer will spend uh, one movement point to uh, rotate one hex, so you'll be, that'll be one, two, three, four, five. Now, that would be a great move, except remember I'm under received charge orders, so I can't do that. It might be worthwhile to try to change into uh, a, another orders that would allow this movement, because what happens is musketeers uh, can fire into their front, or I should say any of the infantry can fire into their front and flank hexes. If I were able to position him here, he would be effectively blocking off the entire uh, left-hand side of the map. Unfortunately, I'm not able to do that, and I'm not sure that uh, going into make ready orders would be advisable because it's easier to reform the line and uh, to rally if I'm under received charge orders. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with those orders and just slowly move 
the musketeer line over to the left and I'll leave the other musketeer alone he'll simply pass his turn um, stacking in the game is allowed and uh, what you can do with stacking is you can stack one light infantry with one cavalry unit artillery can stack with any kind of unit uh, other than another artillery unit uh, so you can have artillery stacked with heavy infantry or with cavalry or with light infantry but the, the thing is is whatever counter is on the top is the only one that's allowed to fire out of that hex uh, or engage in close combat so um, you have to be careful about that now with infantry and cavalry when they're stacked together they're given a movement point they're treated as though they're a single unit uh, you can split them apart if you wish, but if you want to move them together and engage in combat together, they can do that, but they only have six movement points. So the Parliament actually has a line of, of mediocre heavy cavalry, but with a musketeer underneath it. So we're going to go ahead and just kind of move those guys up. We're just going to creep them forward, like so. And, whoops, those guys came apart. Okay, so they're not sticking together for some reason. There we are. And that's it. I'm just going to leave those guys as they are. I don't see any need for continuation, so I'm just going to go ahead and mark uh, Ramsey as finished. Okay, so we've done a number of things uh, with, our, uh, with our formations here. Um, let's talk a little bit about Army Commanders. Uh, it's going to play is going to pass back over to the uh, the uh, royalist side because they've still got formations under charge orders. And what we're going to do here is we're going to activate uh, uh, Astley's center line of the infantry, the heavy infantry on the parliament side. Uh, army commanders basically they never become finished. The counters have a finished side to them uh, that can be of of some use, but technically they're never really finished per se. Uh, every time a formation is activated, uh, the army commander is allowed to do one thing. And uh, this is the list of things it can do. You can influence an orders change if you are in or adjacent to the wing commander. So King Charles is adjacent to Astley. If he had a modifier, it might be useful to use his one thing if I wanted to change Astley's orders. Uh, since King Charles doesn't have a modifier, um, this advantage is kind of uh, not very useful. Second thing an army commander could do is he could move. If he moves, remember though, he can't do any of these other things. Um, third thing he could do is he could influence continu continuation or preemption, but again, King Charles doesn't have a modifier. Uh, third thing he can do is he could reform a unit regardless of that unit's orders. In fact, uh, that unit would be allowed to completely ignore its orders so long as it's stacked with the army commander or adjacent to the army commander. That's where King Charles is going to be doing most of his things. He can also rally a unit as long as he's in or adjacent to that unit, uh, again, regardless of the formation's orders. So army commanders are very important because of those special abilities. What King Charles is going to do is he's going to go ahead and move. And he's going to move eight movement points, two, four five, six, seven, we'll go and stack him with his son there. And uh, then he's, he's basically done for this activation. So I can mark him as finished just as a mnemonic to remember that he's done his thing for this activation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about combat. We've talked about movement, so let's look at a little bit of combat. We're actually going to have a combat opportunity here, and that is the artillery on the royalist side is going to get a chance to shoot. It's a good idea to do that now because line of sight is blocked by units, both friendly and enemy. Um, well, technically not enemy because uh, of grazing fire, but uh, if you have friendly units in between the firing unit and the target, uh, you draw a, a line of sight thread uh, through the from the firing unit to the target. If it passes through a, a hex with blocking terrain or a, a hex containing a unit, uh, then the line of sight would be blocked. Uh, the 12-pounder here, we draw a line of sight thread so you can see who he wants to shoot at. We're going to go ahead and try to mess up the formations here of the enemy. You can see he's got plenty of room here to uh, shoot at this target. 
which is 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 hexes away. Heavy infantry firing 12 hexes away. Remember, that's well within the, uh, the 17 hex max range on this piece. Uh, at 12 hex range, a uh, 12 to 24 pound uh, artillery piece has a minus 2 fire modifier. So I'm going to throw a D10. And a 1 is a resounding miss. So nothing happens there. Whoops. All right. I need to mark him as fired. There we go. All right. So he's fired. Uh, the 12 to 8 or the 4 to 8 pounder at 12 hex range has a minus three modifier. So I need to roll pretty much like a nine, I think. And that's not going to do it. To resolve artillery, you basically look at the range chart to find out the range from the fire unit to the target unit, including the the target unit's hex, but omitting the firing unit's hex. And then you uh, you look at the range in hexes, you cross-index that with the uh, the type of unit that's firing, it'll give you a modifier. And then you look at the artillery fire table, you cross-index the unit that's firing with uh, the, the die roll, and you modify the die roll according to uh, um, the state of the firing unit, whether it's uh, morale shaken or um, uh, for the range modifier. You also got to consider if the target was in a hedgehog or column formation. Uh, that can impact things. So he's fired, and uh, that's all that they'll be able to do. Um, we're just about done for tonight. I wanted to get into close combat, but time is getting short here. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, because close combat is much more involved than fire combat, I'm going to just show you a few things about fire combat. There's basically three different kinds of combat in the game. Uh, you have the artillery combat, uh, fire combat, you have the regular fire combat, uh, and then you have close combat. Close combat has a tendency to be a um, more of a crapshoot, and it either works spectacularly or fails spectacularly, usually. At least that's been my experience with it. Uh, fire combat, there's, there's several ways that you can kill enemy pieces. One is by uh, eliminating its strength points. Remember, the number in white is the uh, its, its strength point rating, and... Uh, if a one strength unit takes a, a hit in uh, in fire combat, it can only take one casualty. So just one uh, one casualty inflicted on a, a one strength musketeer is enough to kill it permanently. Um, the other way that you can kill a unit is by breaking uh, the unit down uh, morale wise. As a unit degrades in morale, uh, if it gets to morale broken, it'll begin running off the towards the its retreat edge of the board. And if it exits the board, it's gone forever. It doesn't come back. Um, if you attack a unit that is in a morale-broken state, they usually die uh, at that point, too. If a morale-broken unit takes another morale hit, it's, it's gone. It's dead. So that's, uh, that's the, the, one of the ways that you can kill a unit. The other way is to inflict uh, casualties on it. So fire combat is how you inflict casualties, strength point losses. Uh, the, as you take strength point losses, your own uh, combat ability is degraded, and uh, and slowly over time, attrition can can begin to really take its toll on on units. So there's there's kind of this balance you want to strike between inflicting strength point losses and then hitting them with with close combat to try to uh, knock the unit's morale down. You can take morale hits from from fire combat, but uh, usually it, your fire combat is only going to inflict uh, strength point losses. With artillery, artillery tends to inflict formation hits. It can also provoke a morale check though. For a morale check, you roll a d10 and you compare the result to the, the number in the red box, the, the, the troop uh, quality, its, uh, its tactical rating. Uh, and if you roll uh, higher than that tactical rating, in your morale check, then it degrades one level in morale from normal to shaken, from shaken to broken, and then if it was already broken, it, it dies at that point. All right, so fire combat. Let's uh, let's go ahead and pretend that Prince Rupert's got another activation here. All right, let's see here. I'm just gonna move some of these guys up so you can kind of see what uh, you know what's what here. One of the things I could do, and I'm gonna go ahead and fix the the morale 
on uh, or the, the formation on a couple of these guys. There we are. Okay. What I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to use Rupert to try to engage in uh, fire, and I'll, I'll bring uh, these musketeers up into uh, up into here. Let's pretend that uh, Rupert's got charge orders again. So let's select him and change his orders to charge. Okay, under charge orders, everybody's got to move adjacent. So I'm going to go ahead and take this musketeer and I'm going to move him up here like so. Now. We'll talk more about reactions next week, but um, there would be an opportunity for this uh, musketeer, the opposing musketeer, to fire at, uh, at our guy because we moved to Jason. So to engage in, in uh, fire combat, light infantry and cavalry use their own table. So on the fire tables, you're going to use the, the light infantry and caval cavalry fire table. And you're going to use the column because we're firing with muskets here, uh, it says commanded muskets, musketeers, or dragoons are going to use their own column. Cavalry pistol fire uses a, a different column. The modifiers are, if you're shaken, open order, uh, you get a minus one uh, modifier. If your formation is shaken, rather, or, or you're in open order. If your formation is broken, there's a minus two. Um, if you're using advancing or retreating fire... Uh, that's that's something that uh, you're going to use more with heavy infantry than with uh, musketeers. It, it's really not efficient here for, for our musketeers. Uh, it's a minus three modifier. Uh, if you've got an arquebusier, which we don't have in this particular battle, uh, then there's a plus one modifier, and then there's some there's some other modifiers based on uh, uh, different battles. If the defender's in a hedgehog or column formation, there's a modifier for that. Um, Commanded muskets and dragoons get plus one for each strength point greater than one. So if we fire with the red here, the red unit, the one strength musketeer at the uh, the royalist musketeer that moved adjacent, there's not going to be any modifier because he's got a strength of one, and basically he needs to roll an eight or a nine to inflict a, a step loss or a, a strength point hit. So he rolls a three and he misses. Now let's say the situation was reversed and it was the royalists firing at the parliamentary musketeers, he would actually get a plus two modifier because he's got a strength point rating of three. But remember, you can't move and fire in the same activation, so he'd have to wait for another opportunity. Um, during, your, uh, during your turn, though, regardless of orders, you know, say it's Ramsey's turn and he fires with his musketeers and misses, well, then the other musketeer can fire back, and that's how fire combat's going to be kind of a give and take sort of thing. If we were firing with the Royalists, we get a plus two modifier. And so, let's see, a zero. That's a pretty, pretty big resounding loss there, a miss. Um, let's imagine for a moment that the, uh, the, the, the Parliamentary Musketeer rolled really well. Let's just hit this thing. Okay, we hit an eight there. Let's say he rolls an eight. That's a step loss. So what we got to do here is we got to put a strength... Put a strength of two there. I just made a notation on the counter to show his strength is down uh, from three down to two. With a physical game, you just put a one marker underneath the counter or on top of the counter as you prefer to note that it's taken one uh, one casualty. When you take casualties, it's important to look at a table called the casualty threshold table. Uh, on this table here, you cross index the original morale of the unit with the original strength of the unit. Uh, this guy here has a, a morale of 6 and original strength of 3. Cross-indexing the 6 with a 3 to 4 on this casualty threshold table, you find the number 1. That means when he takes his very first hit, he has reached his casualty threshold. What that means is he has now permanently gone to morale shaken. So his casualty threshold has been reached. And so we're going to mark him as morale shaken. Also... Whenever you take a hit, there's a chance that you will be required to take a morale check. Units with a morale rating of 6 or less must take a morale check after every single hit. If you have a morale of 7, uh, or excuse me, if you have a, a, a quality of 7, uh, I think that's called troop rating, I don't remember the exact terminology. So let me look it up here. I get it mixed up with Great Battles of History. Morale rating, if, it's called morale rating. If you have a morale rating of, of 7, it takes two hits in one single fire action to provoke a morale check. 
generally that's going to have to come from a heavy, heavy infantry unit. Uh, they're the ones that can inflict serious losses like that. If you have a morale of 8, it takes 3 hits in a single combat to provoke a morale check. So here the commanded musketeers uh, are going to have to take a morale check, so they would have to dice. He rolls a 9. That is, that is higher than his, his morale, and so he's gone. He's morale shaken already because he's reached his, his uh, threshold, and so he's actually going to drop down morale again, and he becomes morale broken. When, immediately when you become morale broken, you have to retreat two hexes towards your retreat edge of the board. So he's got to go back. And Morale Broken, I didn't mention this last week, is a form, it's a hybrid because it's a morale state, but it's also a formation state. Morale uh, Broken units have no facing. They just simply move towards their edge of the board, and they have a morale rating of 1, which makes them extremely vulnerable in close combat. So that's just an initial look here at, uh, at fire combat. With, uh, with uh, Cavalry, I'm just going to go ahead and put Byron up here. Uh, let's say Byron goes ahead and fires at uh, Waller and his commanded muskets. When you fire with, uh, with, with Cavalry, there's a modifier plus one for each strength point greater than three, and a minus one for each strength point less than three. Byron's got a strength of four, so he's going to get a plus one modifier. He rolls a 1 and misses. Now, here's the thing about cavalry. When they fire, they only get two shots with their pistols. So I already marked him with a, uh, with a pistols marker. And it, you'll see that it appeared actually on the counter itself. And if I mark him with pistols again, it gives two crossed pistols. That means he's used both of his shots. In order to reload pistols, you have to do a reform action with that unit in order to recover one pistol, a second reform action would then recover the second pistol. Now when he fires, um, his target's given an opportunity to fire back, assuming that it survived the initial fire. Uh, fire combat is sequential, it is never simultaneous. So Waller gets to fire back, but he's stacked with musketeers, and in this particular case, they're both uh, allowed to fire back. It's kind of a special situation. So Waller will fire back with his pistols and he rolls a 1 and misses and the commanded muskets roll a 2 and they miss as well. So we're going to mark him with pistols and that's how um, that was that was pretty uh, pretty uneventful. You'll see some of these other cavalry on the royalist side like Rupert's cavalry here. Um, it's got a strength rating of 3 Really, they're not really uh, good at, at just running up and shooting pistols at things because there's no modifier. And with on, on the, the pistol table, the, the, uh, the cavalry pistol fire table, uh, basically you need to roll modified 7, 8, or 9 in order to score a, uh, a strength hit. So with only a 30% chance, it's usually best with these high morale guys with low strength value to use them in close combat. In other words, charge in and try to break them that way rather than uh, to engage in a, in a pistol fight. Whereas these low morale guys like Waller and, uh, and his partner there, uh, Goodwin, uh, their morale is pretty low. It's a six unit. They're, they're pretty vulnerable in close combat, but he's got a strength of four, which gives him a, a better chance to uh, sit back and fire. Plus, being in a receive charge orders does uh, enable that, that, uh, that guy to be able to reload his pistols faster. Okay, we are just about out of time here. I will look, though, very quickly at uh, the devastating abilities of, uh, of heavy infantry. Uh, what we'll do here is we'll just do a plain out slugging match here between... Uh, uh, Gerard and uh, Essex. There is a form, there, there's basically, let's see, one, two, three, there's four different ways that heavy infantry can fire um, in their, uh, during their, their activation phase. Okay, you can, you can do what's called normal fire, uh, skirmish, it's called skirmishing fire, which is when you're adjacent to an enemy, uh, you have an enemy unit that's uh, adjacent to you and in one of your frontal hexes you may fire at it. Uh, there's salvo fire, which is like skirmish fire, but it's more devastating, and it also um, inflicts a, a morale check on the opponent. 
And then the third form is a what's called advancing fire. That allows you to move a unit forward one hex, regardless of terrain, engage in fire with a steep minus penalty, uh, and you get to do all that before the other guy gets to fire back. The other form is retreating fire, which is when you're adjacent, and like so, and you get to move backwards and fire, um, another again with a steep penalty. It's a, a way to disengage. Um, Let's go ahead and look, though, here at uh, just regular uh, skirmishing fire. So I'm going to go ahead and put Gerard here right next to his target. Let's say, well, no, let's, let's do advancing fire, because that's usually how you're going to want to engage a line. He's going to move forward one hex. Now remember, this is not movement. This is actually considered fire. And then he gets to roll uh, fire combat. We're using the heavy infantry musketry tables. And heavy infantry firing, uh, there's, there's two different tables here. There's actually heavy infantry and heavy infantry with regimental artillery. You know it has regimental artillery if there's a little artillery symbol on the heavy infantry unit. We don't have any of that in this battle. You find them mostly in the later battles of the Thirty Years' War. So, we're going to use the, the left-hand side, the heavy infantry. Heavy infantry that are two hex um, units have three frontal hexes. But because a, this is a, Gerard is a two hex unit, he actually gets to roll two dice. Once for the left side of the counter, once for the right side of the counter. So, let's put it this way. I'm going to use salvo counters, but basically he's firing uh, like this. This, this side, of, the left hand side of the counter is firing here, and the right hand side of the counter is firing here. So that's that's how he's engaging. And both sides get to fire before the target gets to shoot back. Alright, you can also fire heavy infantry at somebody in the flank. Let's say that his target was situated like so. Let me get rid of the salvo markers. If he was situated like so, the left hand side of Gerard would be able to fire at the Essex uh, Brigade there. So that's, that's another opportunity, but firing out of the flank is, uh, has a much less chance of uh, success. So normal fire from the front, or excuse me, advancing fire from the front, there's going to be several uh, opportunities for modifiers. You get minus two if you're in open order or uh, form formation shaken. Minus three if you're formation broken. Obviously you couldn't do a advancing fire if you're in formation broken, but... Um, Minus one reaction fire versus moving cavalry. Minus one if you have been marked with a salvo marker. Uh, minus three for advancing fire or retreating fire. Minus one for each casualty point on a one hex unit. Uh, so if you've taken casualties, it degrades your, your shooting ability later on. Um, for two hex units, it's minus one for every two casualty points on that unit. So here he moved, he, he's using advancing fire, so he fires once for the right. Okay, six modified to a three because it's advancing fire, inflicts one hit. And left hand side of the counter fires a seven, which becomes a four, which is also a hit. So he inflicts two hits here on Essex. So what we would do is we would mark him down uh, two strength points. So, well, I guess there's several ways you could do this. I'm going to use that as a, a measurement of how many hits he's taken. So he's he's taken two hits. Um, now, because he's a morale six unit, he's got to take a morale check. But because he took two hits, he takes a morale check with a plus one modifier. Okay, so if he'd taken three hits, you take a morale check because of the first hit and then a modifier plus one for each additional hit. So he rolls a five plus one for six, and he just barely passes the morale check. He then is able to fire back, but he's not advancing fire, so he can use uh, frontal fire or he can use salvo fire. So he's going to go ahead and try to go ahead and use the, the salvo fire. And a 5 on a salvo fire modified by a minus 1 because he's taken 2 hits on a 2x unit. Uh, it's a 4 and inflicts 1 hit. The second side of the counter fires 6 modified to 5. On a salvo is also one hit, so grand total of two hits uh, were inflicted here. So strength, we'll see, he took two hits. 
Now, two hits on a seven morale unit inflicts a morale check with no modifier, so he rolls, and he himself is also good. Um, actually, th that would be a modifier plus one, because when you're subject to salvo fire, you um, must take a morale check. And, uh, and then an additional... Um, for Basically, whenever you take a morale check, there's a, a plus one modifier for each additional trigger that would also cause a morale check in that same instance. But because this guy fired salvo fire, he's marked with a salvo fire marker, which is going to inhibit any future fire this turn. The salvo marker would remain on him until the marker's removal phase. So if somebody else, like this guy here, uh, went ahead and, and rolled up on him, let's go ahead and rotate him uh, clockwise. Uh, let's say he rotate. And by the way, whenever you change facing with a two hex unit, it costs two movement points. So it's it's hard to maneuver these guys. So that would be two movement points to do that, and then one to move adjacent like so. Uh, that would put him in a in a pretty good position. Now the the Essex could make you know a reaction fire against him because he moved adjacent to his uh, to his flank there. But because he's marked with a salvo marker, it would be a minus uh, uh, minus one modifier for salvo minus one because of the two step losses. So his single shot, and you can only salvo once per once per turn. Uh, well, that's a good roll. He rolled an eight, minus two. So six from the flank column inflicts a step loss then on, uh, on Wentworth, which is a six morale unit. So he would take a morale check, and he would roll four and pass that. So that is the nuts and bolts, basically, of fire combat. Uh, next week we'll look at uh, we'll look a little bit more at fire combat in more depth. We'll also look at reactions more carefully, and uh, we'll get into uh, close combat. So thank you for uh, for tuning in, and uh, we'll, like I said, if you missed lesson number one, we'll be uh, uploading the video to that uh, this evening.